ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to give the biggest, warmest possible welcome to first year graduate student at the University of Washington, Mia Faulkner. Roughly 
two reasons. One, it is impossible to take an SCSS and put it on your personal laptop and download it. And you know they just don't make laptops like that these days. Um, but the other thing is that there's not enough time in a human lifespan to look at all the objects that we want to look at one by one. We can't do it. We need the help of computers in order to make this happen, right? So I just want to highlight that what we're getting is new types of data. But what that's requiring of us is new ways of solving problems. And this is kind of what I want to talk about going forward, right? So let's bring it back to nightly alerts. Again, a nightly alert is a computer book who's saying, hey, there might be something super exciting up there. Um, but actually what it's saying is that something changed in the sky. So if you look over here, we have um, an example of a new image, a new image with something really bright in it. Then. Um, Right in math. Okay, so we see a new image, and <laughs> and there's something really bright in it, and um, we file back through previous images of that same part in the sky. Right, they're called reference images, and we don't see anything. Right, so we take the subtraction, the new image minus the reference image, and what we're left with is just this really bright, really new object. And the computer is very excited and sends you an alert and says, "Hey, there might be something super exciting up there." Right. But the computer doesn't always know if what has changed is actually exciting or not. So it will send an alert for things like telescope errors, when there's something going on with the detector, so there's some sort of change in brightness, um, and it's just an error. I like to think of these kind of like bugs on a windshield, right? They're like in your field of view, but you don't really want to see them. What you want to see is the road ahead. And the road ahead for astronomers can look like um, variable stars, so stars that naturally change their brightness over the course of a night or a couple weeks. Um, they could be, um, oops, my flanker, butter. They could be supernovas, so the explosive deaths of stars and the creation of many of the he heavier elements that we see in our universe. Um, they could be asteroids, so rocks that are flying quickly past our few field of view. Or, you know, they could be just like some binary neutron star mergers, right? And the, the heaviest, they're the most dense objects in our universe colliding, to, whoop, colliding together and literally sending ripples into space, right? So a computer will produce an alert on any one of these objects, and it's up to us to find a very clever way um, to differentiate them. So astronomers differentiate these objects by their light curves. A light curve is essentially a graph of light over time and the pattern that this light curve makes can tell us about what type of object we're looking at. So in this first example of a variable star, we're gonna, one type of variable star is called a binary. In a binary star system, it's actually two stars that are orbiting one another. And as they orbit one another, especially in this particular case, when there's a larger star and a smaller star that is orbiting it, we get this pattern of a big dip, ooh, I can use a laser, a big dip, and then a small dip, and then a big dip, and then a small dip. And that is the pattern that we have identified as a binary star, okay? Another example is a supernova. When a supernova explodes, you get this extreme um, emission of light and mass, and then it kind of peters off as that energy dissipates into the surrounding environment. Um, so astronomers have observed very many supernovae and identified that this is what a supernova looks like, a peak, and then it sort of tapers off, right? Um, but again, we're at this point where we can't ask a single astronomer or even a group of astronomers or even all the astronomers in the world to try to spend all their days looking at these light curves and trying to figure out, is this a supernovae or not, right? So we need the help of computers. So specifically, we need the help of machine learning. I'm gonna talk about two types of machine learning today. The first is supervised learning. In supervised learning, we say, okay, computer, this is what a binary star looks like. Big dip, small dip, big dip, small dip. This is what a supernova looks like. It's really bright and then it peters off. So what is this? And you can just shout it out. Binary star, amazing. And the computer got it too. So we say, thank you, computer, that was amazing. You killed it. Um, we will use you as a classification. There's also unsupervised learning. In the unsupervised learning, um, we essentially give the computer a whole bunch of images, and we say, okay, you don't need to know, oh, come over here, you don't need to know what they are, just if you could please sort them into categories so that we can later figure out what they are, that would be super great. 
So the computer says, well, you know, these look kind of similar. They've got that sort of big dip, little dip action. These look kind of similar. They got a peak and then they taper off. And these are some sort of like wonky, triangly, what do you think? Um, and we say, thank you, computer, that was amazing, thank you so much, this is perfect, because now we can identify these objects. And speaking of, we're going to identify these objects. So, um, can anyone tell me what kind of object this signal comes from? It could be a binary star, a sepiate, a pulsating dwarf, or a pulsating dwarf or a supernova. Amazing! So good, you're all killing it. Okay, what about this one for advanced nerds? A little bit louder? Pulsating white dwarf! It is not a pulse anyone dwarf, but thank you. <laughs> anyone else? Sepiate, awesome. Okay, so a sepiate is a standard candle, which means that it has a very specific relationship between its period and its luminosity. So when we know how the period, we can know how bright it is, and um, with some extra maths, um, inverse square law, we can tell how far away it is, and that's very important for understanding how big our galaxy is, among other things. Okay. Um, but one more time, it's, it's not enough to just know what these objects are. We need to make sure that the people who care about certain objects can hear about them, right? We essentially need a broker of some sort, right? We need some sort of broker to take all this information about what we've learned, um, what we've learned that we've observed, and send it to the right people. So that if I'm super excited about supernovae and binary neutron star mergers, I can know when these are happening quickly and accurately. Um, I just want to note that this is not a stock photo. This is Lauren Simmons, the only full-time female stockbroker on Wall Street. So just like, shout out to her, right? Excellent. Yes, amazing. Um, but astronomers have their own brokers. Among these is the Arizona NOAO Temporal Analysis and Response to Events System, otherwise known as Antares. Clearly astronomers are still killing it in the... Um, in the game before you like make words out of other words, we're just like, acronyms, again! <laughs> 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 Still killing the acronyms. Um, and Antares is amazing because it, what's kind of how we're launching into this new age of astronomy. Antares is one of, and, and other brokers, are one of the first instruments that are putting like tons of time and money and effort and time are, are spent creating them and using them, and that they did not once look at the sky itself. So this is an incredible piece of, um, this incredible instrument, incredible piece of software, um, and it's just showing kind of this development from individual astronomers going to individual telescopes to this very, like, collective nature of how are we as a whole going to invest in this certain telescope, and then everyone, um, or everyone who's put money into it, because capitalism still exists, everyone <laughs> can use them, right? Um, and so, and so, and I also just want to like note that this is also how human astronomers are entering into the big data era. Starting with SDSS, but even more so with LSST, professional astronomers will spend their entire life like doing astronomy and good professional and groundbreaking astronomy and potentially not once visit a telescope, which is radical, right? Um, but not only is this type of system new types of data forcing us to find new ways of solving pro uh, problems, it's also offering us a chance to ask new types of questions, right? So right now, at the University of Arizona, Professor Ann Zubladoff is asking, could we predict what kinds of galaxies we're looking at based on the variable objects within it? So again, we're studying the whole sky every couple of nights. There could be a situation in which we find that a particular type of object is coming from a particular point in the sky, we know they're all coming from the same distance as well, and we can ask ourselves what that um, what that population of objects tells us about their surroundings, even if we can't actually look at their surroundings itself, right? Um, Monica Bobra at Stanford University is asking, could we predict solar flares? So this is one of my favorite things. Um, solar flares are ejections of mass and light and energy from the sun, right? Um, and what happens when there's a solar flare is the machines that we use usually to observe the sun, those machines can actually get damaged if the solar flare erupts and they're looking at it, right? Because um, they're that sensitive. And so 
When a solar flare happens, NASA needs to know how to protect their instruments, and it's very cute. Really what the instruments do is just like turn away from the sun, and it's very sweet. But, um, <laughs> but what happens right now is there are humans watching the sun constantly, babysitting the sun to make sure it doesn't act up too much, and if it does, letting the parents, NASA know that, um, that they need to protect their instruments, right? Um, and so, but if we could predict solar flares, then we could save all of that human power and, um, and do so automatically and send us an automatic notification that there might be a solar flare in 10 minutes or whatever, right? Um, right here at the University of Washington, Daniel Lupe Kaufman, who is hair flip, my advisor, and also double hair flip right there. Um, <laughs> One of the things that Daniela is asking is what methods could we learn from other fields? Because what happens is when you take an astronomy question and you riddle it down to a data question, what you find is that the way that we take our data looks really, really similar to the types of data that they use in seemingly unrelated fields, right? So we want to study astronomy. Um, but people studying urban development, the way that they track populations of humans looks really similar to how we track um, the light coming out of a supernovae, right? Except they're measuring people and we're measuring photons. But it's a similar process. Right now, whoop, I'll come up here. Right now at Columbia, um, there's a professor that's studying exoplanets and collaborating with, ling with linguists. And the way this works is if you think of a planet like a word, and a solar system like a, like a sentence, and, and a galaxy of solar systems like a text, you can use similar software that linguists use to derive grammar from text and apply that to a galaxy to understand the physics going on within it. In a similar way, ecology is just like galaxy evolution. They both describe cycles of matter and energy in a particular space, right? And again, right now, there is a professor at Yale University who studies instabilities in protoplanetary disks, or the very beginnings of planets, as well as instabilities in the stock market, finds a common methodology between them, and publishes in both. So this is incredible, right? And it's not just these fields. Astronomy is connected to chemistry and archaeology and biology. And I think this is what I find so exciting about this new era, is it's not just data-driven astronomy. It's data-driven everything. And that is all I have for you. So thank you. <laughs>while those questions are being answered, I forgot to give you the signal that you should turn in your trivia sheet so that we can grade them. So please bring in your trivia to the front table and we will grade them during the break after questions. Do we have questions?
you sync your machine learning on this data set, and it comes to find that there are these five really cool objects that are totally different than every other object we've ever seen, with an, an amateur astronomer with their telescope to try to go look at those objects. Now, obviously, it'll depend on like what type of object it is, how close, how bright, um, but that could absolutely be a part of an amateur astronomer's contribution to astronomy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, what's up? Uh, this person has worked with Zooniverse, um, uh, another iteration of that is Galaxy Zoo, so basically crowdsourcing astronomical data and using humans as the classifiers, um, citizen scientists, in order to contribute to astronomy. And she was asking if, oh, they were asking if, um, again, crowdsourcing to citizen scientists could be, could be helpful in this kind of new data era. Um, and I think absolutely. I think that is 100% a possibility, um, and I am all for that, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think that's another way that amateur astronomers can contribute, and so that's an awesome thought. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 